Okay. Well, good evening to you too. And thank you, Ben and Steve as well for the nice introduction and for being back here at the Mug. It's been a long time and uh, it's great to be back. It's also, I'm, I'm really touched to see that uh, one of my classmates from New England College is here from Kentucky and my daughter in Portland and, and my friend from around LA. It's just, it's great. I need you and it's lovely to see you. So I spent the day uh, watching uh, the Dodgers beat the Cincinnati Reds zero to nothing. I love baseball. Eight, eight, eight to nothing. Eight to nothing. Eight to nothing. <laughs> eight to nothing. Yeah, zero to nothing, of course. Well, there you go. That cancels that out. All right. <laughs> you may quote me. Uh, no, it's eight to nothing. And uh, I love I love baseball. I love baseball because there's always a solution. The game is at the beginning, the middle, and the end, and it is solved at the end. And this was solved, and it was the Dodgers. And so my first poem, of course, is Night Baseball. It was getting there right after work. It was two innings played in the dusk. It was lights coming on in the third. And it was moonrise in the sixth. It was starlight after the game and walking out of the circle of lights and driving home past bedtime and getting undressed in the dark and watching the game on the ceiling and winning and winning and winning. This is called Huey. Here's a clip of cinema verite for you. Back in the 50s, my friend Huey had drunk himself into a future as black as the inside pocket of a full dress suit and was sleeping in an abandoned car in a vacant lot on Cherokee Avenue, fresh out of ideas. He'd been a studio award band when he'd been anything a sweet little guy the stars made excuses for when anybody would listen, but eventually everybody stopped listening, except one guy, Eddie, an accountant from the Warner Brothers days. Eddie went through Hollywood slamming car doors until he found Huey, dragged him out and took him to one of those alky meetings at the old players club. Sobbing and shaking, Huey sat nose to knees in the back of the hall, too unsteady to hold the coffee cup Eddie gave him. So Eddie got a spoon and was feeding it to him when a low, sonorous voice said, Welcome. Huey turned and looked into the back of the cave eyes of Bella Lugosi, who sat down and laid a heavy arm across his shoulder. Jesus, Huey. I know, I know, said Bella. This is Tobias' dog. Tobias was no fool. When sent with Archangel Raphael to collect a debt in sinful media, Tobias was wary. He whistled for his dog. The story is found in the Apocrypha. It has everything. A devoted son, a guardian angel, a giant fish, a virgin, a demon, everything, and a dog in the Bible. The gender of the dog is unknown. She will do for now. Marty painted her as a white hound leaping at the winged Raphael. Lippy. She was the curly-haired monk, bedraggled, footsore, game. For Rembrandt, she was up and barking, fur smudged and tangled. Some unknown artist showed her sitting beside Tobias, head cocked, stunned by the appearance of a house-side fish. Tobias, on his journey, found fortune and a wife, 
Raphael fulfilled a covenant, killed a dying demon, and healed the blind. The dog chased rabbits, clutched birds, made boats on the trail, barked at the fish, sat quiet at sunset, slept in the hollow of Tobias' knees, and awakened joyous at dawn, most likely. This is New Year's Eve. 1938. He wears the floor length gown, white slipper satin bias cut, neckline too low for a bride, but just right for a lover of champagne, dance bands, and tables for two at the short club. He looks handsome in his tux, most men do. He has his black enamel cigarette case and gold lighter, and still she leans forward, holding a match to his lucky. Do you think, he asks her, that by next New Year's Eve, we'll be at war? Oh, God. I think I want to take off his shoes. I think I want to slip out of this dress. I think I want to feel it slide over my thighs like liquid skin. I think I want to follow it down. I think I will die if I don't. Okay, now we're coming to uh, part of my book that uh, We'll take a little explaining, let me put it this way. It is as I remember it. And I've written it as I remember it. And um, perhaps the title of the next poem, which is a long series of poems, and the title is also long. The title is The 12 Days in August When Herman Lytle Rescued a Half Drowned Kitten from Franklin High School Thugs Pumping Water from a Fire Hose into the Hall Locker where they had trapped it. And I got to keep the kitten. And the United States dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the war ended and I turned 16. Now, I'm just going to give you a few of the days. There are 12 days and a poem for each day, but I'm giving you just a few of the days. Okay. Monday, August 6th. The force of 100 sun, bright beyond white, blast enough to curl the edges of the world. Star of the brain and crippled comprehension. Acres of dead halfway to the moon in Lodi Town. Newspapers, photos arrive. Scenes of devastation, such suffering, I have run outside for the comfort of breeze. A world born anew. New words, new fears, new guilt. This is August 11th, uh, because of the war, uh, all of this takes place at Edinburgh State Teachers College, where we all were going as high school students, we were doing advanced courses, and I was doing advanced courses in the uh, art department. And at the same time, Franklin High School's football team was practicing. So now we have Saturday, August 11th. Herman's a dumb name for a savior. Skinny, sopping wet, dirty glasses, and blonde crew cut. A dumb look for a hero. The art building's a dumb place to find a home for a sodden kitten, but it worked. It all worked. I named it Lazarus. This is August 14th, early in the day. Now the war, 
laboring for its surrender, has frowned and is named. Betting pools limit the wagers to days and hours instead of weeks. I put 25 cents on my birthday, 9.30 a.m., August 17th. I am late. The last day listens its way around the clock, heavy with the tedium of waiting. Ozone, wet copper smell promises lightning, printing the day on my skin. The sirens come first, then shouting, fire alarms honking and insistent, empty classrooms into the street, car horns challenge church bells, numbing, dizzying echoes in the blood, sheet lightning walls the crouching sky. Night falls as the wind rises. Front doors open all along the block. People rushing, crowding, embracing their way to one another. On the arm of a woman I've never seen before, I am dragged onto someone's already crowded porch. A man is handing out bottles of beer. Pat, my father's favorite. I take one, clink bottles with the woman, and plug a lug. She suddenly bursts into tears and staggers off the porch to sit weeping on the curb. The beer man watches her, lights a cigarette, stops, mumbles an apology, and hands it to me. The beer man comes back with a fifth of bourbon and holds it to my lips. Obediently, I drink until he stops pouring. He puts his arm around my shoulder and leans in, Sour mash breath, exhaling his opinion of my cute cupcake breast. Astonished, I thank him. And this is Saturday, August 18th, the last day. A humid, heavy, sticky day. Clouds hang low and expectant. My father, coming to take me home for a weekend birthday celebration, carried my duffel. My father with Lazarus in a milk crate. Suddenly, my father stops, looked around as though someone just called his name. Distant thunder rumbles. He's coming, he says. We're in for it now. It's for the consolation of Orion. It was to be called the Constellation of Orion, a poem about isolation with myth as metaphor. The first line would be, dark matter doesn't even come close. But with accidental accuracy, I tapped out the Constellation of Orion. Only Orion seems beyond consolation, separated from his beloved player Merope. I think of him, his club raised, his belt emblazoned with the brightest of stars, a brilliant globe set in his knee, and none of those glorious jewels of any value to a man alone, a hunter robbed of quarry. I expect he walks the past like a game trail, paler stars flattened by his last passage in a dream of this girl he left behind. I expect he pictures her in the virginal company of her sisters wearing a crown of fidelity. Sirius trots at his heels, offering a dog's devotion and to Ryan's path crosses the upper and lower earth. The earth that cracked free of Scorpion to kill him. Scorpius would follow Orion if he could, but the gods consigned him to the far side of heaven. They passed each other with the day, Orion rising as Scorpius sets, Scorpius rising as Orion sets, thick and imprisoned in the consequence of time. I wonder if he looks down at us in the dark. Does he seek 
the fractures of related cities, fires, flares? Is it a comfort? Is it promised love and warmth? Is it anything like what we find gazing at him? Remembrance of a unique passion, of a brilliant moment, blazing and variable. Thank you.